Well, good morning. I am Judy Pizzo, the transportation planner with the Florida Department of Transportation District 5 out of Deland, Florida, and the project manager for the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group. On behalf of the Florida DOT, I would like to welcome you to our virtual Central Florida Transportation Planning Meeting. I also want to thank LTAP for hosting this virtual meeting and making it accessible to a statewide audience. CFTPG meetings have been hosted quarterly by the department, District 5, since 2007, providing a forum for transportation professionals, our local government partners, elected and appointed officials to stay updated about local transportation initiatives, transportation trends, and hot topics while receiving professional development credits. The CFTPG is supported by a board of advisors represented by the department and Turnpike staff, local governments, industry representatives, and the University of Central Florida Engineering and Planning Departments. I want to thank them for their time and support in assisting us with topic selections and recruitment of speakers. You can find more about the CFTPG recent past presentations and our board members on the Florida DOT's Forecasting and Trends website, Vesutimus Online. That's F-S-U-T-M-S Online under the tab MTF User Groups, as well as videos of our recent virtual meetings from August and October on the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council's CFGIS website under the Florida DOT meeting materials. Today's event, as noted earlier, will also be recorded and materials uploaded to both of these sites. Currently, this is the last CFTPG meeting planned as we're going on a hiatus. Yes, typically I tease you with ideas of what we might be presenting next year, but uh, so far we're on a hiatus. So if you're on our mailing list, you'll hear from us when we're back. And if you're not on our list, please fill out the feedback survey we'll provide at the end of the webinar, and this will ensure you'll hear about any future events that come up. I, almost, I also must thank our distinguished panelists for taking time from their busy schedules to join us today as well. The brainstorming and practice sessions that were held to prepare for this event. After our August and October events, we received a lot of interest from our audience regarding how transportation has been impacted in 2020 and we could not have asked for a better representation to discuss the topic than this distinguished panel. Our event today, you will be hearing perspectives from a national panel, including the Transportation Research Board, Massachusetts Department of Transportation, New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and to closer to home, a Florida transit agency, Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. These presentations will be guided by our very own FDOT State Safety Engineer Brenda Young. At the end of the webinar, again, please take time to complete the feedback survey to let us know how we did on this session. And again, if you're not on our list, this will ensure you'll hear about any future events. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Ms. Young, who will facilitate the remainder of this session. Brenda serves as a State Safety Engineer for the Florida Department of Transportation. Brenda's 21-year transportation career in both the public and private sector includes technical and management experience in planning, design, traffic operations, construction, modal development, and safety. She is active in transportation industry, having served on various boards and statewide teams <clears throat> excuse me, to advance transportation safety and mobility. Brenda earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering from University of Central Florida, go Knights, and is a licensed professional engineer and certified public manager. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, painting, dancing, and traveling with her husband, Todd, and their four-year-old Greyhound, King. Brenda, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be back in Central Florida as part of our Central Florida Transportation Planning Group. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We have a wonderful and timely session prepared for you today. Our transportation planning practice is ever evolving, 
and our colleagues in this profession have continually adapted to meet the needs of our communities and travelers. 2020 has brought even more challenge to our state of the practice to meet those needs. The reasons travelers need to travel and the modes they choose have continued to evolve, and this year has accelerated that rate of change almost overnight for many. As with other aspects of our lives, we are learning new and better approaches to our daily activities, and we must continue to be creative and thoughtful with our approaches and make informed decisions. As we've experienced and observed the changes that 2020 has ushered in, many of us are seeking ways to retain the positive trends in sustainable travel choices and active transportation modes. At the same time, some of our travelers have had not much of an opportunity for that flexibility in the travel choices they must make every day. So while we adapt to evolving needs, we must remember to continue to provide for these travelers. Some of the pre-2020 innovations in transportation have experienced a pause due to the challenges this year has brought. So as we recover, we need to anticipate how these will fare moving forward. In Florida, our industry has made great strides shifting to context-based planning and design with the adoption of our complete streets policy, and our strategic highway safety plan has established the target of zero for serious injuries and fatalities. So we're keeping these core principles in mind with all our resources and initiatives moving forward as well. Because of our virtual needs and capabilities with this forum, as Judy mentioned, we not only have the opportunity to hear from our Central Florida colleagues, today we also have the opportunity to hear from national experts sharing their approaches with us so that we may learn and expand our knowledge together which is the purpose and spirit of this forum. Given the virtual nature of our forum, we have incorporated elements to engage you as our audience in various ways. As Kristen mentioned, we will feature polling questions on the screen to gather your feedback, as well as get a pulse in your understanding of various aspects we'll be discussing. We'll also have that interactive Q&A session at the end. So as our panelists are presenting, please submit any questions you may have in the chat box. If your question is for a specific panelist, it will help us if you identify that person specifically too. So let's get started with a couple of great icebreaker polling questions that will warm us up for our first presentation of the day. Prior to February of 2020, what was your primary mode of travel to and from work? Excellent, thank you, Kristen. So it looks like uh, the majority of our initial travels uh, were, were primarily personal auto, uh, followed by transit, uh, walking, biking, carpooling and ride sharing, and in working from home. The, 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 the primary lead here is the personal auto. So thank you all for your responses to this question. Now, next question, what is your current mode of travel to and from work? Same options, let's see, let's see what, what this year has brought in, in, and changed for us. This should be very interesting. Ah, there's a significant increase in teleworking. Uh, we sort of expected that. There's still some personal auto use, it seems. Um, and we still have some folks walking, biking, riding transit and carpooling, um, but a very, very small percentage there. So, so this is great. It, it just goes to show the, the impact of 2020 on our attendees that we're, we're uh, presenting to today. So thank you very much for this. Here's another great question. What was your work flexibility prior to February of 2020? Did you have flexible uh, with days and times? Did you have flexibility in location? Um, flexibility in days, times, and location? Oh my goodness. It looks like the flexibility pre-2020 could use a little work, huh? There we go. It does look like some, some flexibility existed with days and times as well as location. Very good. Uh, 
All right, so what is your work flexibility now? Wow. This year has truly been amazing and impactful on our work lives, that's for sure. It's a significant amount of folks have now the flexibility to work from home, uh, either full-time or part-time. This is great. This really gives us a finger on the pulse of our audience today. Thank you very much for your responses. All right. And with that, I would like to share a presentation with you um, of Neil Peterson, the Executive Director of the Transportation Research Board. I would love to introduce him to you. He has been the Executive Director of the Transportation Research Board since 2015. In that role, he provides executive direction and leadership to TRB's technical activities, including its annual meeting of over 14,000 transportation professionals, 180 technical committees, its conferences, and its publications, its peer-reviewed policy consensus studies, and its multimodal cooperative research programs. Prior to joining TRB, Neil spent 29 years at the Maryland Department of Transportation, where he served the last eight years as State Highway Administrator and Governor's Highway Safety Representative. Over his career, Neil has been involved in volunteer leadership roles in both TRB and the American Association of Transportation Officials, also known as AASHTO, including serving as the chair of TRB's executive committee in 2011. Please join me in welcoming Neil to our panel. Thank you, Neil. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brenda. And it's really a pleasure to be joining all of you uh, today. Uh, I am uh, going to go through a presentation that will talk about what the impacts of COVID have been uh, this year. It'd be interesting to see uh, how some of the numbers I present compare with uh, your poll results. Uh, and then uh, for uh, I will do it by mode of transportation, trying to cover all the modes of transportation. And then uh, just some thoughts in terms of key considerations affecting long-term demand by mode. And I'll wrap up with some cross-modal and uh, longer-term issues for con uh, consideration. I will warn you that there's a lot of information here. I will be going through it very quickly, but uh, the presentation will be made available for all of you to be going back and to be uh, looking at the data a little bit more carefully. So uh, Brenda did a good job in introducing me uh, and going over what uh, activities we have at TRB. Uh, we're best known for our uh, annual meeting, uh, which will be held virtually this year. And I'll have information when I wrap up on being able to uh, attend that. We also have uh, four research programs in highways, transit, airport, behavioral traffic safety. For this audience, you're probably most familiar either with our National Cooperative Highway Research Program or our uh, Transit Cooperative uh, Research Program, but we also have them for airports and for behavioral uh, traffic uh, safety. And we are part of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. We, we do do uh, studies on behalf of the federal government, uh, advising the federal government as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I will start with uh, aviation, one of the modes that has been uh, most impacted by uh, COVID-19 this year. And uh, I will try in most instances to be giving you data from uh, the depths of uh, travel demand or when lockdown was uh, most uh, impacted each of the modes. And then the most recent information that I've been able to find out so uh, on April 14th, there had been a 96% reduction in uh, the number of people going through TSA checkpoints. As of uh, last week, that was still down uh, 68%. And we've also seen reductions in flights uh, for uh, the week um, uh, of Thanksgiving. Domestic uh, flights were down 35% and international flights down 59%. Uh, in looking at pre-COVID-19 trends, we had been seeing uh, fairly steady growth in uh, aviation uh, travel of, of about 4 to 8 percent per year since 2015. As we look to uh, some of the long-term considerations in terms of impact on demand, obviously the length of the economic recovery, uh, when the public will be confident that it's safe to travel through airports and uh, airplanes again, 
One of the things that we've seen is particularly for business travel that's been uh, replaced by telecommunications. And we'll see to what extent uh, telecommunications continues to substitute for that travel. Uh, changes in leisure travel, uh, we have certainly seen uh, most leisure travel that has taken place, taking place by uh, auto instead of by air. And then the rate of vaccine availability will obviously also be affected. When we look at highways, I'm going to first uh, uh, look at uh, pasture car travel. Again, at the depths of the lockdown on April 4th, uh, nationwide, there was a 44% reduction. As of last week, it was still down about uh, 10%. Uh, it has varied quite a bit by metro area, depending upon COVID restrictions within the metro areas. And we've actually seen a few met metro areas where travel has uh, actually increased over 2019 uh, levels. Uh, again, in terms of pre-COVID uh, trends, we had been seeing a pretty steady 1% to 2% growth in uh, vehicle miles of travel with congestion gro uh, growth in some metropolitan areas, particularly in, in the south and, and west. And looking at longer term considerations, uh, it's interesting that if you go back over the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, vehicle miles of travel have uh, really followed very closely uh, uh, GDP and economic conditions obviously will uh, continue to impact uh, passenger travel. Uh, but we have some uh, new considerations as well. To what extent will trip substitution through telework, telemedicine, uh, other uh, types of, of um, teleactivities uh, reduce the uh, travel demand, particularly during peak periods? Uh, what will be the uh, modal diversion? Uh, we've seen very, you'll see in a few minutes, um, uh, information for transit. Uh, how will uh, people go back to transit or not? And what will be the impacts on vehicle miles of travel? Uh, we'll, uh, it will be interesting to see what impacts there will be in terms of both uh, density of development and distribution of activities. Uh, we've already started to see some businesses moving out of central business districts, for example. And then auto ownership. Prior to COVID, some of the um, increases in vehicle miles of travel have actually been as a result of, due to the healthy economy, people who did not previously uh, own owning autos uh, now being able to uh, own them. And we've also seen reductions in auto ownership directly as a result of uh, COVID. Other than aviation, public transportation has probably been the mode that has been most impacted by uh, COVID. As of last week, nationwide, there was still a 70% reduction uh, in uh, nationwide averages, uh, but it has varied by mode. Uh, so in looking at uh, the Washington, D.C. area, for example, on rail, uh, there was still an 88% reduction from 2019 uh, levels as of uh, last week. Uh, bus uh, over the course of COVID had not been reduced nearly as dramatically. And this is pretty consistent across at least the large uh, metropolitan areas with bus not having been impacted as much as, as rail and commuter rail uh, continuing to also be uh, impacted. Uh, one of the areas that has been most impacted, one of the metropolitan areas that has been most impacted has been a San Francisco area, which continued to have a 90% reduction as of last week. So in looking at pre-COVID-19 trends, uh, between 2015 and 2019, there had been a 7% reduction nationally. Uh, that had varied by metropolitan area, but it was pretty consistent in terms of reductions in most metropolitan areas on the order of about 2% uh, per year. Uh, looking at long-term considerations again, uh, when will uh, transit travelers be willing to return to crowded vehicles and stations? What would be the impacts of uh, switching to telework on public transportation? Uh, if you look at some of the data uh, by um, uh, where in the metropolitan area there you have seen the biggest impacts of telework, it has tended to be in the central business district, which is also where the largest number of public transit trips uh, go. So uh, following what happens to telework is going to be uh, very informative in terms of long-term impacts on public transportation. Changes in density and distribution of activities, particularly office space, 
to what extent will uh, offices continue to be, especially in central business districts, uh, auto ownership and the willingness of governments to con continue to pay uh, subsidies. Uh, ride hailing or transportation network uh, companies were also very impacted uh, during the lockdown period in March and, and April. Uh, Uber ridership actually decreased by 94% uh, in uh, late March. There were major layoffs of employees by both Uber and Lyft. If we look at third quarter uh, ridership, uh, Uber was still down 24% and Lyft down 44% from 2019 levels. Uh, the both companies have really done a lot in terms of publicizing their uh, safety measures and both companies, especially Uber, has um, shifted to uh, food delivery to offset the reduction in passenger travel. And in fact, it is um, really what has been the majority of the revenues uh, for uh, Uber in particular uh, during the pandemic. Uh, again, if we look at uh, pre-COVID-19 trends for ride hailing and TNCs, there had been dramatic increases, especially in central business dis districts and trips to airports over the last five years or so. Uh, Long-term considerations, public confidence in safety of shared ride uh, vehicles. Um, perhaps many of you have read about some, some of the profitability issues that have been experienced uh, by both Uber and Lyft and uh, whether they will uh, be able to uh, become profitable in the long term will probably affect what the future is going to be of ride hailing. And then integration with transit as part of, of uh, a mobility as a service approach and uh, the rate at which we will start to see automated vehicle shared ride uh, services. Looking at micromobility, uh, during uh, the peak of the pandemic, many of the private companies in particular downsized or suspended services with some of them pulling out of some markets altogether. Uh, we've seen major increases in bicycling uh, and uh, use of e-bikes, but most of it has been privately owned. Uh, only in New York have we really seen significant increases in bike share uh, ridership and it's actually been down in most other metropolitan areas and that's really been uh, the hypothesis has been that it's, it's due to reluctance to use shared vehicles that uh, might be affected. So again in terms of uh, pre-COVID trends for micro mobility there was an explosion in use of e-scooters. Uh, we've seen uh, reductions and in fact, some of the companies going uh, out of business um, with a steady use of uh, uh, bike share systems. Uh, in terms of long-term considerations, public acceptance of use of shared vehicles, profitability for the companies uh, to, re, uh, uh, to be able to replace those that have pulled out of the market, conversion of travel lanes for bike or other micro mobility use, and then uh, owned bicycle uh, use uh, has uh, increased dramatically. And the question is, will that continue? Um, okay, so next I'm going to talk about uh, telework. And this is some data from uh, University of California, Davis, that showed that uh, prior to COVID-19, about 68% of people were going to the office um, five days a week or more. And you can see the split for a number of days per week with uh, less than 10% to actually teleworking uh, full time. Uh, during an average week during the pandemic, uh, about half of all uh, travelers were, or excuse me, of uh, workers who are working from home with about a quarter uh, continuing to uh, go to their work site uh, five days a week uh, or more. So again, in terms of pre-COVID-19 trends, we had been seeing increases, uh, gradual increase uh, up to about 10% telework uh, full-time. Again, with 68% traveling to the office five days a week. So uh, think, looking at long-term considerations, how many COVID-19 teleworkers will continue to uh, telework long-term, either part-time or full-time? And we're, here, we're reading a lot now about the expectation that people will go uh, back to the office maybe two or three days a week and telework two or three days uh, a week. But uh, what will uh, corporations do in terms of adopting new telework um, 
policies and what will be the impact on peak period travel, especially for transit. Switching now from pasture travel to uh, goods movement. Uh, again, changes from 2019 during the peak of the pandemic, we saw long haul truck traffic decrease uh, 10%, obviously not as nearly as dramatic as uh, pasture travel decreases. Because they had to continue to uh, supply the, uh, the goods to, uh, to um, all citizens. Uh, as of uh, November, interstate truck traffic actually was 5% higher than it was in 2019. Uh, local deliveries within metropolitan areas saw a 25% reduction uh, in April and it was back to 2019 levels by uh, August and has continued. Uh, some issues here have been hour of service exemptions and uh, how long they will continue and food and rest area uh, issues for uh, long haul truckers as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Pre-COVID-19, we had been seeing steady growth in uh, truck travel, slightly faster than pasture travel growth. Again, long-term considerations will be economic, uh, the rate of the economic recovery, uh, supply chain uh, uh, changes. So for example, will there be more sourcing uh, domestically? Uh, e-commerce, uh, you'll see when I get to e-commerce, huge increases in e-commerce and its impact on last mile on deliveries from distribution centers, uh, continues to be impacted by truck driver shortages, and then the rate at which automated trucks uh, start to come into uh, the fleet. Uh, looking at freight rail, uh, during the peak of the pandemic, again, we saw uh, double digit decreases. Uh, and uh, as of the end of November, we uh, continued to see small decreases in uh, total car load traffic, but uh, actual increases in intermodal units, uh, containers in, in particular. So total rail traffic was uh, up just uh, slightly, but uh, very strong rebound from the low point. Uh, if we look at changes by individual product, interestingly for total car loads, the largest increases have been in grain, and that's pr uh, probably been driven largely by exports of grain uh, with largest decreases in coal. Uh, and that's been uh, really as a result of uh, switch to more uh, renewable uh, sources and natural gas. Um, so pre-COVID-19 trends, uh, rail volumes have been steadily decreasing since about mid-2018. Long-term considerations, again, the rate of uh, the economic recovery uh, trade policy uh, impacts rail quite a bit. Uh, changing in sourcing for parts and materials and locations of manufacturing. Uh, during the peak of the pandemic, actually what we saw the biggest impact was on uh, auto parts, but that has now uh, come back uh, and recovered. And then decline in use of coal um, and uh, switch to renewable uh, energy sources. So next I'm going to talk about uh, marine uh, traffic, and this obviously is most impacted by imports and exports. And this is a uh, graph from IHS market of uh, the real value of US exports and, and imports uh, going all the way back to 2000. But you can see the huge decreases that occurred in uh, uh, 2020 expectation of a very large uh, increase uh, taking place uh, this coming uh, year and then uh, going back to more of a steady state by 2024. So uh, as of May, containerized cargo at U.S. ports was down about between 20 and 25 percent uh, from 2019 levels. Bulk cargo movements uh, down about between 15 and 25 percent depending upon the port. And uh, the biggest impact really was on cruise ships, where, which is a major revenue generator for a, a lot of ports, especially uh, in Florida. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, we had been seeing port ton tonnage increasing uh, each year, especially uh, exports. Long-term considerations, again, the rate of economic recovery, trade policy, domestic sourcing of parts, the recovery of the cruise industry, and export of grains. Look at uh, e-commerce uh, uh, during the uh, peak of the uh, shutdown, uh, online ordering nearly doubled, 96% uh, 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 increase. Uh, by the third quarter, that was still up about 37% uh, over 2019 uh, levels. 
be very interesting to see during the holiday season uh, what the uh, impact is going to be. Uh, dramatic increases in delivery of meals and pharmaceuticals, uh, in addition to the normal uh, dry goods that uh, uh, e-commerce serves. Uh, impacts on distribution centers and last mile deliveries, and we're now starting to see more use of robots and drones uh, for deliveries. So again, uh, pre-COVID-19 trends by uh, 2020, uh, we saw 16.1% uh, of um, uh, retail commerce actually being e-commerce uh, increasing, you can see from 2017 levels of 10%. So uh, long-term considerations, will COVID-19 shopping, shopping habits be retained? Will there be expansion into additional markets? Uh, this will be uh, somewhat driven by what the future brick and mortar stores are, especially malls. And we're seeing more and more of those going out of business. And then use of uh, autonomous vehicles, including robots uh, and drones. So wrapping up just, uh, Everything so far has been for individual modes, thinking about cross-modal and longer-term issues, changes in location and density of economic uh, activity, including location of jobs and manufacturing, uh, supply chain issues, uh, thinking about vulnerabilities and need for, for uh, resilience. I think you're going to see uh, a lot more distribution of uh, manufacturing, especially manufacturing being done overseas to multiple locations rather than just being dependent upon one uh, nation. Telecommunications is a substitute for uh, travel and not just telework or telework, but teleshopping, telerecreation. Uh, integration of new mobility services uh, with transit. And I think we'll probably come back and discuss that a little more during the question and answer period. Uh, impact on the development and deployment of autonomous vehicles long-term implications of unemployment on auto ownership and modal usage, and social equity issues exposed by the pandemic. I think any one of these topics probably could have been the subject of an entire uh, webinar, and we have a lot of uh, consideration for future research uh, in these areas. So uh, here is uh, information. You can find out more about TRB at our website, which is very easy to remember, trb.org. I encourage you to sign up for our uh, weekly e-newsletter if you uh, aren't already signed up. You can become a friend of uh, any one of our 180 uh, committees uh, at mytrb.org. Um, I recommend that you uh, use our TRID database, which is a bibliographic database of over 1 million uh, entries as the resource. And I invite uh, each and every one of you to, to participate in our uh, virtual TRB annual meeting, which is going to be held over the course of the entire month of January. Again, you can sign up at our website, trb.org. And with that, I thank you and I turn it back to uh, Brendan. Thank you, Neil, for bringing this broad and informative national perspective, outlining the impacts of 2020 by mode and these tips for consideration for our industry moving forward. This was fantastic. We love that you have shared your slides and, and that will be posted for our viewers as well. Um, with that, we have a couple of more polling questions before we introduce our next presenter. I'd like to pull those up on the screen now. So get out your menti.com devices and let's poll. So our question here is approximately what percentage did U.S. bicycle sales increase between April and July of 2020 in the prior year? This is a great trivia question for 2020 for sure. All right, we've got a lot of folks thinking 60%, 80%, 100%. You're probably wondering what is the correct answer and the answer is D. According to the NPD Group, a national retail sales tracking firm, total bicycle sales increased by 81% from the prior year. Sales topped $3.4 billion. Thank you very much. Next question. What sources of data have you used to collect bicycle and pedestrian counts? Choose all that apply. So we've got Strava, We've got Streetlight. We've got our very own District 5 Transped tool, manuals, machine counts, and of course, other. 
Wow, it looks like a very broad group of, of data selections here. That's very good. I'm guessing that many of you are selecting more than one. A lot of manual and machine counting is still happening, but we're also using technology sources such as Strava Streetlight and our TransPED tool, which kind of gathers a lot of that other data together all in one place. Excellent, very good. Thank you all. This is great as we prepare for our next presenter. Please allow me to introduce Jessica Bass. She is the Director of Performance Management for the Office of Performance Management and Innovation, also known as OPMI, which is a shared office between the Massachusetts Department of Transportation and the MBTA. Ms. Bass focuses on performance management, measure development, and reporting at OPMI, overseeing the production of the Massachusetts DOT and MBTA yearly performance report called Tracker. Prior to her work with OPMI, Jessica worked at the US DOT Volpe Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts for over four years, where she worked on projects for FHWA, the Federal Transit Administration, and the National Park Service. She holds a bachelor's in science from the University of British Columbia in environmental sciences, and a master of urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois, Chicago. So welcome, Jessica. Thank you for joining our Central Florida Forum today. Uh, thank you, Brenda, for the intro. Um, it's great to be here uh, with the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group and the LTAP Center um, and be amongst such distinguished uh, panelists. Um, I think I'm having issues advancing the slides. Oh, there we go. Okay, I think I have it all set. Okay, so um, as Brenda said, I work in the Office of Performance Management and Innovation. I just wanted to give a quick introduction to the office before I go into my presentation. Um, we do work across the MBTA and MassDOT, so we get to focus on really all modes. And besides performance management, we also do data strategy and research. And you can find a couple of our key reports and dashboards on the bottom of that slide. So just a quick agenda of my presentation today, I'm going to give an overview of our mobility dashboard and some of the overall trends we've seen in different transportation modes, and then really hone in on what we've seen in bicycling, walking, and transit, and touch on a couple of programs and policy responses that we have um, implemented in response to changes in transportation patterns. So the mobility dashboard was developed in partnership um, with a bunch of different departments in MassDOT and the MBTA with our Office of Transportation Planning and GIS Services really taking the lead and getting the website online um, and putting all the data up there. So I wanna make sure to give them a shout out for all the great work that they've done. Um, the purpose is really to track all of our transportation trends in one place. At the beginning of the pandemic, we found that a lot of people within the agency were sending around various emails in sort of an ad hoc fashion. And so we wanted to have a one-stop shop where everyone could come and get all their data from one place. Um, we developed this dashboard because of the pandemic, but I think it's actually just sort of a good sort of business and operation practice to have this up for the for our people that work at our agency and the public. So we are planning to continue to update it into recovery. Um, and at the bottom of the link, I have the, the link to the mobility dashboard. It's kind of a wonky link, but if you type in mass.mobility dashboard into a search engine, it should come up for you too. So here's an overview of the data that we have on the dashboard. I wanted to just give everybody an idea of where it's coming from in case anyone is interested in putting together their own dashboard. So the majority of our data does come from internal sources, whether that's our counters on our highways or our validation systems on the transit side. We do have subscriptions to INRIX and Streetlight as well, and we're using INRIX to get travel times on select corridors that were congested before the pandemic, so we can kind of track if that is coming back. And then we're using Streetlight to get up-to-date uh, VMT data and then also some of our uh, biking and walking data. 
We do also have some data that is from publicly available sources, such as the, our bike share system data, and then data from um, Massport, which oversees Logan Airport. So all of these sources together can start to paint a picture of what is happening within each mode and then some of the dynamics across modes too. So what are some of the trends we've seen? Um, Neil did a great job of covering sort of what is going on nationwide and this is sort of a high level overview of what we've seen in Massachusetts. Um, so this chart isn't on the dashboard but I just wanted to sort of put everything together in one place. So you can see that for vehicle miles traveled, MBTA transit ridership, bike activity, and airline travel, there have been declines that started in March and went to a steep drop-off point in April as compared to 2019. Um, pedestrian activity is really the only mode that's seen an increase across the state for most of this time period, perhaps as more people are trying to get out for walks around their neighborhood or replacing other trips with walking. And I just want to note that while ridership on the MBTA, which is the Boston Metro Transit System, has remained quite low, uh, Massachusetts does have 15 regional transit agencies in the state, and ridership on those systems has seen a much stronger recovery. So now I'm going to focus in on bicycle and pedestrian activity data. Activity data. Um, we did MassDOT get a subscription to Streetlight back in May of 2020, and the timing for that actually worked out to be perfect. Um, we got the subscription uh, originally to support our statewide bicycle and pedestrian plans. One of the goals of the plans is to have better data on these modes. So now we are able to look at things like um, mode share and origin destination analyses um, and travel volumes for uh, bicycling and pedestrian modes. So this slide shows um, bike activity in April and October of 2020 as compared to 2019. So if you see light blue or dark blue, that's showing an increase over 2019 levels, and then anything that is sort of pink or red is a decrease. So you can see in April there was really um, and the majority of municipalities an increase in biking um, overall. And then that red area sort of on the right uh, of the slide is Boston. And that in Boston, we did see a decrease in bicycling. And that is likely because people were using it as a commute mode. And so with the stay at home order, um, there was a big decline in bicycling in the area. And so even though overall, um, bicycling did increase in most municipalities because Boston accounts for about 20% of all bicycling in the state, that that decline in Boston is really pulling down that trend line that I showed um, on the, the previous slide with all the different modes. But you can see sort of going into October, um, Boston has recovered and we are even seeing increases in that metro area. Um, with Streetlight, we can get a couple of trip metrics that are kind of interesting. So we can see that the average length and duration of trips increased in 2020, and also trip circuity increased. So that means that trips were less direct or started and stopped in the same location. So this slide shows our pedestrian activity statewide. And I think it's very clear in April, 2020, you can see almost every municipality had over a 50% increase in walking, which is pretty incredible. Um, again, we have that sort of dip in the Boston area in April, but that has recovered um, to be increasing by October. And so um, the trip metrics are the same that, uh, that we saw for biking, the average length and trip duration increased, and then also trip security increased. So the number of trips that started and stopped in the same location. Okay, I'm gonna move on to talk about our bike share system in Boston. Um, it's called Blue Bikes, and this system has over 3,000 bikes at 300 stations in Boston and then the surrounding municipalities. Um, I have the price information on the slide, and then also just want to note that in uh, summer and fall of 2019, the 
system expanded into Everett, which is sort of between Chelsea and Malden on this map. Um, and we also had an increase in stations uh, and bikes throughout the whole system. So this slide shows the total weekly rentals um, from January to October um, with 2019 and 2020. And you can see that in early in the year, 2020 actually was starting off higher than 2019. And that is likely a part due to the expansion of the system in the fall and summer of 2019. Um, we do see that decline that happened in March, kind of going into April and the rest of the year. But on the whole, I think that this has recovered um, much better than some of the other modes we've seen. And by the last week in October, um, rentals were only down 11% over the same time period in 2019. Um, and with the blue bike data, we can get some interesting trip metrics as well. So again, the median duration of trips increased in 2020 compared to 2019. The high rental times of day shifted from distinct AM and PM peaks towards a single more gradual evening peak. Um, the share of rides taken by monthly pass holders declined, so we saw more people using the system with day passes or single use tickets. Um, and then again, we saw the number of trips that started and ended at the same station increase. And then just a fun fact, on September 14th of 2020, Blue Bike saw a system-wide ridership record with 14,400 trips in a single day. So clearly there's been an increase in demand for walking and bicycling across the state, and we really want to keep this momentum and translate it into things like more funding, programs, and policies to support these modes, which of course can sometimes be easier said than done. But one thing MassDOT did do um, earlier in the pandemic is start a Shared Streets and Spaces grant program in partnership with the governor's office. So this program is meant to assist municipalities in creating safer opportunities for outdoor recreation, commerce, and community activities. And the program is really meant to be a quick build and implement type of thing. And in the first round of funding, over $10 million was allocated to 100, 103 municipalities. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of demand for this program. And because it was so successful, we launched our shared winter streets and spaces program and we'll be allocating another $10 million over the next uh, four months to these type of projects. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and start talking about some of the trends that we've seen in transit on our MBTA system. So the MBTA is our transit system in Boston and the surrounding metro region. Um, just to give you a quick overview of sort of what we've seen during the pandemic, um, pre-pandemic we used to have 1.2 million daily passengers on our system. And right now, uh, as of October, we're seeing around 330 daily passengers. So about a 75% decline still. And of course that varies within mode. Um, and then on the slide too, I just have an overview of what our system is made up of. So we have 175 bus routes. We have our light rail, light rail line, which is the green line on this map. And then the red, orange, and blue line make up our heavy rail lines, which is our core subway services. We have 11 commuter rail lines that link the surrounding areas to downtown Boston, um, a ferry service, and then also paratransit that operates in 58 um, cities and towns. So this chart is from the dashboard and it's showing our MBTA daily validations by rapid transit line. So you can see that steep decline um, sort of in late March going into April um, and then ridership's recovering a little bit going into late summer and fall, but it is sort of tapering off um, at least for our heavy rail lines. And this is obviously, obviously due to people working from home. Um, The story is a little bit different with bus ridership. Um, bus ridership, as Neil mentioned, um, has remained much more durable than ridership on our subway lines. Uh, we went from about 400,000 bus riders uh, during the week pre-pandemic to a low point of 100,000 
So a 75% decline that has since recovered to about 175,000 passengers a week, so about a 43% decline. Um, and we know from using streetlight demographic data and other data from the census that our bus riders are our most transit critical riders. So the proportion of riders that fall into categories of low income households, people of color and zero low vehicle households um, on bus are much greater than what we see on rail. So through the pandemic, um, we really focused on trying to decrease crowding on routes where ridership has remained high. And we also now have real time crowding information on almost all of our bus lanes, bus lines. Um, and I think going forward, we really are trying to focus on where ridership has remained durable on the system and seeing this is where we need to provide as an essential service. And I think there's kind of been a pivot across our entire ag agency to ensure that all of the trips um, can be made safely. So I just also want to touch on one of the programs that has sort of come out of um, the pandemic, and that is our rapid response bus lane program. Um, in response to the pandemic, we've accelerated the installation of a lot of bus lanes across the system with a particular focus on those routes that are serving um, transit critical populations. And so there, we are going to install 14 miles um, of bus lanes as part of this program. Some of them were already planned for installation, but the installation is being accelerated. Um, and these bus lanes will help reduce crowding and increase bus speeds for riders during and after the pandemic. And I think this program has really been one of the success stories coming out of the pandemic. Um, the cooperation between municipalities and the MBTA to get these installed quickly has really been great. So I just sort of want to wrap uh, the transit section up with talking about our Forging Ahead, Ahead initiative. This is MBTA, MBTA's initiative um, for planning transit service going forward. And so while we have seen deep cuts to our revenue due to drops in ridership, um, we want to make sure that as we plan service going forward, we are uh, making any changes in a thoughtful way that aligns with our changing ridership and demand. So this slide has the goals of our Forging Ahead initiative, which I sort of just touched on. And there's really, as I said, a big focus on providing essential service to workers and folks that are still using the system, and especially those that may make up um, transit critical populations. So I have just a general timeline, two of some of the changes that we are going to make. So in January through March, we are going to make some modifications to the base service that we provide. And then from February to July of next year will be when we are kind of assessing our FY22 budget and making further um, service planning changes. So the changes that we're going to end up making are sort of very dynamic at this point, um, and it will be impacted by many factors like what ridership looks like coming back, the vaccine rolling, vaccine rollout, and federal funding packages. So I didn't really want to get into any specifics on, you know, how much service we're looking at changing by mode, but I just wanted to give an overall uh, framework for how we're approaching this. Um, so this is my last slide and I've packed a lot into this presentation. A lot of it has been at a high level. So if there is any questions about more detail on anything that I've covered, I'm happy to go um, into more detail if there's any specific questions. Um, please do put them in the chat. Um, and these are just sort of some brief takeaways to think about. So at MassDOT and the MBTA, uh, we're really thinking about three phases going forward to uh, plan for transportation. So that's the pandemic period, which we're obviously in now, um, a transitional inter interim period while the vaccine is being rolled out and then sort of transitioning into the new normal. So what are the levers in terms of policy, incentive and programs that can be used in each phase to build back to a no new normal? Um, I don't have the answers, but some things to think about uh, sort of along these lines as we're going through each phase is, you know, a big focus on equity. I think the pandemic and just 
sort of what we see has exposed sort of the dis disparate impacts that we've seen on communities of color, um, low income communities and other vulnerable populations. So obviously that needs to be a big focus. Um, we really need to keep the momentum going too around the increased demand for walking and biking. And so that should be prioritized. Uh, there's, I think, sort of going to be a new role of transit and mobility, and that will obviously be really impacted by uh, trends in telework. And then also just thinking about how we can avoid a return to congestion and growing BMT in places where that's been an issue. Um, and that definitely is a, an issue in Boston. So it's kind of something on the forefront of everyone's mind. So with that, I will wrap things up. My email is there if you have any questions and then there is the link to the mobility dashboard once again. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing your mobility dashboard from Massachusetts and the overall trends you're seeing by mode. We appreciate that detailed information on the walking, biking, and transit modes and your, your policy responses. This is very good information for us here in Central Florida. With that, I'd like to introduce our next presenter of the day. Cassandra Borchers has been the Chief Development Officer of the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, also known as PSTA, in St. Petersburg, Florida for the past eight years. In her role at PSTA, she engages in strategic planning, innovation programs, sustainability planning, financial planning, and funding partnerships, service development and scheduling, data collection and analysis, as well as agency messaging and strategy and public engagement. Prior to joining PSCA, Cassandra managed large multidisciplinary teams at a major national engineering firm. She led a broad spectrum of planning initiatives across the state of Florida for multimodal transportation strategic plans, corridor studies, and capital project development. Cassandra has a Bachelor of Arts in Geography and a Master of Urban Planning, both from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and a past president of the Women in Transportation Seminars Tampa Bay chapter. More recently, she added homeschool superintendent to her list of duties for her two boys who are attempting first and fourth grade virtual school. Thank you very much, Cassandra, for joining us here in Central Florida. Thank you so much, Brenda. It's a real delight to be here. As you can tell, when you work for a mid-size uh, transit authority, you need to wear a lot of hats. Um, and so uh, I'm really pleased to show everyone here today um, how PSTA has moved through this pandemic um, and how we've changed the way that we look at our service and maybe some innovations that we've had along the way. So just to give you an idea of um, our size and our scope, um, we serve um, on a peninsula, we serve a peninsula on a peninsula, um, and that is uh, Pinellas County. We have a population of just under a million people, um, but we just have over 200 buses. We were fortunate enough to complete our automatic passenger counter program um, to outfit 100% of our fleet with APCs. We did that early this year, um, and um, we were also able to get uh, the National Transit Database to allow us to use those APCs for our counts. Um, we have a lot of um, technology on our buses for um, our passengers, including our real-time bus arrival, um, as well as we're, we're partnered with Transit App for trip plans. To give you an idea of where we've been so far, um, I think our director of maintenance is a germaphobe uh, because he started stocking up on sanitization materials uh, probably in December of last year. And we started tripling our bus sanitation in February far in advance of any state of emergency declared by the state of Florida. Um, in mid-March, we did go fare free and we still are not charging fares. Um, we've done this specifically um, as a protection for our operators and in close coordination with our union. As uh, the state and local officials started to um, shut uh, businesses down, uh, Clearwater Beach was closed, so we had to cancel our spring break park and ride, um, and we started to limit the number of riders um, that we had on the bus. I, I put this in as, as a note that we, we started our 
service reduction at the end of March. And one of the reasons that we waited a little bit of time between the time that the state of emergency was declared um, and the service reduction um, is mostly in part that we were work very, very closely with our union and we wanted to make sure that they were on board with how we were rolling out um, any service changes. So we did start to make sure that our, our bus riders were able to cover their faces early on and we were able to give out bandanas as sort of an early way to get people, to encourage them prior to any um, restriction by the local or, or state government. Um, we have mandated that all of our operators uh, wear masks both on the facility and um, in the vehicles. Um, and as I mentioned, we are limiting the number of riders on the buses. Some of the things that we had to do sort of creatively and, and to think about is, is how to discourage loitering at our transfer points. Um, we do have a high population of transit dependent people who are our riders. Um, and some of them had very few places to go during, uh, during the shutdown. And so they started hanging out with us, uh, which we were trying to discourage. We have been trying to discourage people from just riding our system and encouraging people to just take essential rides. Um, but we had to be a little more direct in making sure that people weren't loitering at, at our facility. You see, much like um, the charts that Neil and Jessica showed, we uh, had a steep decline in our ridership um, from the beginning of March to about the end of April, beginning of May. And that was probably our lowest point um, cutting our ridership in about half. Um, since then, we have the same general trend line that you've seen um, from Jessica, where we're slowly um, coming back to what might be an, a new normal. Um, but this is for our system level. And I'll get into some information about our route by route analysis that we've been doing to see how we're going to continue to make our service changes. One of the things that we, we noticed when we started to make our service changes is that we had a few businesses call us and not only were they asking for more service than what we were currently providing, they wanted additional service from where we were pre-pandemic. And a lot of those businesses uh, were essential workers or manufacturing locations where um, we would normally provide um, a weekday service and a Saturday service um, that was slightly different. Now these businesses were going into overdrive if they were um, medical manufacturing, um, and they wanted not only our um, our weekday service back, but they wanted additional service. And now with us going to weekend service on uh, with sun our Sunday level of service, that really impacted them. Um, I would like to show you a little video about our essential workers program. And, and we created this program in partnership with Uber. Um, we already have a number of programs that we partner with uh, Uber, Lyft, United Taxi, and a wheelchair provider on to get people to our system. But this was a real opportunity for us to look at those essential workers that were now, because of the service reductions, not able to take our service and really help them get to work. The pandemic has affected all of life in Pinellas County. When it hit, PSTA needed to adjust our routes and our schedules, mainly because of driver safety. And with many riders not going to as many destinations as they would usually, uh, this seemed to work out. One of the things that we started hearing from riders as we reduced our service is that the routes weren't running early enough or late enough or at the same frequency. So they were not being able to catch their bus at the time they needed to commute to work. So the planning team at PSCA realized we needed to do something to make sure essential workers were getting to work. We already had innovative programs with Uber, Lyft, and United Taxi. So we thought during this difficult time, what if we were just able to tweak what we had in these existing programs to serve these essential workers who needed to get to and from work earlier before our fixed routes started or after they'd stopped running. Hi, my name is Stephanie Glover. 
I work at National Molding. We make medical products and I am a press machine operator there. I was catching the bus and noted the weekly schedule run on the weekend schedule. So that caused me to be to work about 20 or 30 minutes late every day. Bought my supervisor, Eric, he's the one that he gave my name to PSTA, the lady Nicole. And she, you know, she called me, asked me, was I interested? So I was like, yeah, because <laughs> I'm like tired of being late for work. I'm really proud of this program. I'm really, really excited that we're able to help essential workers, people that rely on our service, but because of the reduced service on fixed route, they're not able to get to and from work. But now with this essential workers program, they're able to get a quick, reliable, on-demand ride that they can count on. Uber has been honored to partner with PSTA since 2016, as we are working around the clock to support our cities and communities through this difficult period. We're proud to be able to support the PSTA Essential Workers Program to provide transportation to those who need it the most. The process right now is just to email engage at psta.net and then someone will get back to you pretty quickly, one to two business days, start working with you to see shift times, bus routes, direct connect options, and get that process moving. Thank you, Uber. Thank you, PSTA and the Central Riders. I appreciate y'all. Y'all a big help. <laughs>
and we were starting to get back to more of a 40 and some in some days like Sundays getting back to uh, just a 30 percent decline there was a vast change in how people were getting to the system but not everyone did this was the same not everyone was decreasing their usage there were some people who had surprisingly increased their usage um, and so that was just an, an interesting anomaly but the other part of this that we found from the survey was that there we were going to have some riders that were just lost to us um, and they were not riding due to a fear or they haven't ridden and we wanted to see what would make them come back so post pandemic and again this is july and we weren't really sure how long this was going to last there's no indication of a vaccine and so um, we really did want to know at what point do we start encouraging people to come back and at what at what are those messages that we want to make sure that we get out to people um, we continued as a state to open um, and we did continue as an agency to look at our normal service versus our covid service and we did implement a, a new um, new service on for critical routes, increasing it from that Saturday level of service to the weekday. Um, in addition to that, um, the planning department um, had to do a lot of research about where those pass-bys were happening um, on the system and really have um, some serious conversations uh, with the uh, entire leadership group about whether we were going to increase the limits on, on the buses. And we did this by taking a look at a couple of things. Again, the um, APC data came in very handy for us, um, and as well as cross-checking that with the number of complaints that we've received from, um, from our riders about specific routes. And so we started to hone in on the specific locations um, that people were saying that they were passed by and what the APC data was telling us about the max loads. And so we, convinced our leadership to look at going to 15, knowing that if we went to 20, we could probably solve the problem entirely, and yet we still did not uh, want to change our messaging or um, have people think that it was all right to continue to use the system and be out. So we wanted to take a look at a deeper dive on our specific core routes. And so this is just a comparison of our system versus um, our number one um, route, which is our Route 52. So as you can see, the dark blue line um, shows something that's very similar um, to what everyone else was experiencing as our system. Um, but our workhorse routes are starting to climb back up into that realm of what is, what is normal for us pre-pandemic. We and we wanted to make sure that people could continue to use that and focus in on what some might be some opportunities to um, increase the service on those routes because those are the ones that people are using the most. So we did take a look at some of our top routes um, and what the average loads were for our June booking and then in early October after we had made some additional changes to the system. We took a, a very detailed look at each trip um, and the average load at, at that location and this really helped us devise a what we're calling a covid release overlay which we're planning to deploy in february and this looked at three particular routes that are having trouble keeping up with the um, demand for their service and how we would we would overlay this covid relief service on top um, this is um, was a great opportunity for us um, both in terms of helping people out, but also gathering the data about what is the effect on the increased frequency on our system. Um, someday we will talk again about a transit referendum to help fund our service, and we'd like to be able to use this data from this COVID overlay to demonstrate the impact of, uh, that we can make, especially on those workhorse routes, if we transition those to um, higher frequency and BRT routes. We did take a look at what our budget changes would, were for fiscal year 21 and made sure that the COVID overlay could last until the end of our fiscal year, just in case um, there was a change in the distribution of a vaccine, because we do think that these will eventually go away once we can increase the number of uh, people that are allowed on the bus. 
Um, so despite those challenges that we have had in just the ridership and the changes that we've been making um, and the number of service changes that we've explored and then actually implemented, we have been able to continue with some of our um, great capital investment uh, projects, including um, our electric bus program, which includes the only induction charger uh, east of the Mississippi, um, and we're quite proud of that. Um, and we did take um, delivery of four new electric buses um, just in the last couple of, of weeks. Uh, we started construction on our Sunrunner project, which is our first BRT project in the region, uh, connecting downtown St. Petersburg to St. Pete Beach. So I hope once all this is over, you all come to our Central Avenue corridor um, and enjoy the Sunshine City. Um, we will have some great art on our buses um, with our Mr. Sun iconic um, art project from Chad Mize, which is a local artist. Um, and we just launched um, our autonomous vehicle project in downtown St. Pete with a new pier opening. Um, this is a short demonstration for um, just a few months uh, before the uh, Grand Prix comes to St. Petersburg um, and connecting the historic Benoy Hotel to the Dali Museum. We've had some great success, um, not just connecting with the Cross Bay Ferry, um, but having a lot of people take advantage of this opportunity to uh, look at autonomous vehicle um, technology and see if people are willing to continue to, to use it and how we can deploy the, this kind of technology in the rest of our system as we move forward. I'm going to really look forward to the questions for the panel, um, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Cassandra, for sharing PSTA's detailed analysis of data and your informed responses to the challenges of 2020. Not only are we impressed by your many hats, we also appreciate learning about your thoughtful and creative approaches. So thank you very much for joining us in Central Florida. Uh, before I introduce our next presenter, I'd like to tell you a couple of quick fun facts about the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Um, the MTA has more subway and commuter rail cars than all other U.S. transit systems combined. Can you imagine this? They have the nation's largest bus fleet and operate more subway and commuter rail cars than any other U.S. transit system combined. Also, they employ more than 77,000 people. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Mario Philippe, the Chief Operating Officer of New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Mario has worked in the transit and rail industry for over 30 years, and his experience ranges from Senior Rail and Transit Regulatory Manager, building and operating a new light rail system, the Ottawa O-Train, managing the transportation business line for Siemens Canada and leading the transit business line for AECOM in Canada. He also worked as general manager for Novabus, a Volvo company, with responsibility for transit buses for the North American market. He also worked in business development with Thales and his final assignment with that company was that of president and CTO of Thales Transportation and Security Inc. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mario took responsibility of the MTA's agency for bus, NYCT, bridges and tunnels, Long Island Railroad and Metro North Railroad in January of 2020. He brings unique understanding of operations, government and regulations, procurement, business development and management to the industry. Having worked on various sides of the industry allows Mario to understand all the aspects of the business and the subtleties of the level of government decision-making, funding, and procurement. Mario holds an MBA from the University of Quebec in Montreal. Thank you, Mario, for joining us today. Thank you, Brenda, for this uh, very kind introduction. It's uh, my pleasure to, to be here with you this afternoon and uh, share uh, the experience uh, of the MTA since my arrival there and coincidentally the arrival of COVID. So, I didn't bring it with me, but uh, it kind of looks like it. Um, so just to repeat a few fun facts, right? Uh, the, the MTA consists of five agencies, the Long Island Railroad, which is a, a very old uh, rail, railroad that was put together by amalgamating 
uh, several older uh, pieces of railroads. Um, Metro North Railroad that goes up, uh, Long Island Railroad, of course, goes uh, to, the, to the tip of uh, Long Island, both the North and South Fork. Metro North goes basically north um, up Manhattan and then goes west of the Hudson River uh, into Connecticut. Um, and then, of course, NYCT subway, which is, uh, which is a significant subway system by any standards, uh, 472 stations and over 6,000 uh, subway cars. Uh, NYCT bus and MTA bus, uh, which, uh, which is a compendium of the NYCT uh, bus system together with a, uh, you know, an amalgamation with uh, New York City. Uh, bus system that's that was only on Manhattan, uh, which is called MTA bus, and of course bridges and tunnels uh, that uh, allow access to uh, New York City. Uh, five bridges, three tunnels, um, all told, which is really really good because it brings some revenues as car traffic increases. Um, so the arrival. Uh, the, that's the arrival of COVID and mine coincidentally, as I've said before. So. A few, a few things happened right when COVID uh, happened is we had to do things that that we never did before uh, at the MTA. Uh, it arrived very quickly in New York City um, and uh, it had devastating effects. A lot of our employees got sick. Uh, New York City, you'll recall, was the global pandemic at the center uh, towards the end of March. Um, so we had to be very creative, very innovative quickly uh, in order to, to, to do things we'd never done before and also listen to the health advice of uh, various uh, health organizations here in the United States as well as worldwide to find out in real time how to, you know, to, to fend this enemy that, that was attacking us on all sides. And the, the advice was changing almost quickly, you'll recall, right, from uh, touch points are very dangerous to you don't have to wear masks to all of a sudden you have to wear face covering because of uh, droplets and then later on change to the droplets aren't so bad but it's vaporizing so so COVID germs in the air that you breathe that goes a lot a lot longer distance than previously thought. Um, so as you see on this this slide um, we started sanitizing uh, subway cars, buses, rail cars, which we never did before. We cleaned them, um, as everybody does, but now we needed to uh, to use, uh, you know, rags and, and various other things to really sanitize those cars. And when you run a 24-hour, um, seven-day operation, it's quite difficult to get to all those pieces of rolling stock uh, on a daily basis, let alone all the stations and the touch points um, all over the system. Uh, so we had to be creative and innovative, as I said. Uh, we started testing a lot of um, um, mists, vaporizers, uh, uh, and, and uh, with various substances uh, to see if we could uh, do things a lot uh, more efficiently, a lot faster, use less human resources because we were running out of people. Uh, and there were a lot of companies out there with promises of, uh, you know, you apply our solution once and it'll be good for three months. You will not have COVID anymore on your rail car, subway car or whatever. Turns out that we did, we became kind of a test bed for the United States. Uh, working with um, large universities, research centers, um, as well as the EPA to do all kinds of tests to really validate if these claims were true. Um, and it turns out that they were not exactly true. Um, um, we also experimented with UV lights um, on the subway cars, as in this picture. We did that on, uh, on uh, buses as well, uh, because UV lights with this in intensity actually do kill uh, viruses, germs, microbes, all those, those nasty little things. Um, but it's difficult to deploy um, every day on every bus, every rail car, and so on. Um, so as a result, we actually shut down the subway service between one o'clock and five o'clock in the morning for the first time in 116 years. And that allowed us to do a few things. Um, by parking the, the, all the trains, uh, we now had access to all the rolling stock every day, which allowed us then to sanitize every piece of equipment, train, bus, or subway uh, twice a day. 
and having uh, more time and, and deploying the resources more effectively, we were able to sanitize the stations, all the, the train, bus and uh, subway stations also several times a day, which increased the confidence by everybody, our employees and the traveling public in our system. And they could see that we were doing everything that we could uh, to keep um, everybody safe. Uh, we stopped collecting cash um, on the two railroads, on on uh, on the bus system and on the subway system. So all these kiosks in the subway uh, stations uh, were not collecting cash anymore, and we uh, basically pushed people towards the metro card machines where they could still use cash or their credit cards or other forms of payment, but cash having the reputation of not being the cleanest thing that you handle every day. Uh, we thought it would be better for our employees, but also for the general public if they didn't have to handle cash as much as before. Um, and one thing that we did very early on is we told everybody that we will not control crowding on our system. Uh, because the question, we had a lot of discussions on this in March and April, how will we control how many people go on each bus, train or subway car? And um, short of deploying officers on every piece of rolling stock to count people and prevent more people from coming on when you reach the limit, we just said, hey, if you take our system, we'll do what we can, but we don't guarantee uh, social distancing. But we did mandate the wearing of face covering early on, and that is still in effect. So all employees, anybody who rides the system has to wear a face mask worn properly. Uh, and we do have uh, checks by uh, NYPD on the subway and MTA police on the other modes of transport. And we actually issue summonses to people who don't wear a face mask, they get offered one. If they uh, take it and don't wear it properly or don't wear it, uh, then it moves up to a summons. Um, we brought employees back to work. Uh, we, developed, we put a plan together during uh, April and May. We brought employees back to the offices uh, starting in June, uh, June 8th, um, but very gradually. So what we did is a survey of all of our offices and uh, we split the, uh, the desks, the, the cubicles and so on in two groups, A and B. And, uh, and then we brought up to 30% of our employee uh, population back but split on the A and B schedule. So there were never more than 15% of the uh, full capacity of every building in the office at any time and never sitting next to another person in a cubicle. Uh, and we didn't go up past the 30%. Um, everybody else, the 30,000 or so office workers have been continuing to work remotely since uh, end of March, basically. Um, so we, um, in the policy for return to work, as you can see on this slide, we put all kinds of measures to make sure employees were kept safe. So what you see on the picture is something that we don't do anymore today. Uh, people arrive at staggered times and depart at staggered times so that we don't have crowding on elevators and in halls. Um, we separate the employee population, as I've said. Um, and we said in our policy that Going forward for forever, a minimum of 10% of the workforce will continue teleworking. But that's for the future because now we have more like 70% of the employees that are teleworking. Um, and um, we, um, we also hired a firm to come and evaluate all the congregation areas for the frontline employees. So the bus drivers, subway drivers and train crews, as well as all the maintenance away uh, workers. Uh, to evaluate all the congregation uh, spaces where employees report to work to get their assignments, for example, for buses, uh, lunch rooms, uh, locker rooms, and things like that. And we, we designed a system uh, whereby we would never have crowding in any of those locations also. Uh, so we did that, put that in place um, between uh, well, towards the end of wave one so that we would be ready for the second wave of COVID. Um, so all of this to say that we learned a lot and we, we acted in real time, but here are some data because everybody else presented a lot of data. So there's a little bit of repetition from what we heard from Jessica, Neil um, uh, and Cassandra. Uh, you can see that um, the beginning of this chart uh, is, is towards April. Uh, our ridership numbers dropped to 98%, 98% uh, drop on the two railroads. 
and about um, about 70 percent 75 percent on the subway and 70 percent on the bus system um, so starting uh, in may it started ramping back up again as the um, uh, the, the mandated closing of the basically the entire city and region uh, loosened a bit. Uh, people came back, but very gradually, as you can see. And even today, um, where we're now starting to kind of close restaurants and things like that again, uh, but up until November, let's say, our ridership numbers were nowhere near normal. Uh, so on the railroads, the two railroads, they were still at about 20% of the uh, pre-COVID ridership levels. Uh, and the, the bus system, of course, was the most, like the others said before, uh, the one that came back the strongest. And, and I'll talk on the reasons for that um, in a second. And on the subway, we're still hovering at about uh, 40%, which, you know, 30 to 40% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, it's interesting because in New York City, with all the lines of subway that we have, some lines are congested. Uh, you know, the express lines that go up and down Manhattan, for example, uh, you know, those lines are pretty busy. Uh, the local lines that run on the same track and at the same stations, but stop at all the stations, they're almost empty. Uh, so, of course, our friends from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journals are, are always helpful in showing us the pictures of the crowded subway cars and buses, uh, but they don't usually show pictures of the ones that are running empty. So overall, our ridership numbers are very low, our stats are very low, but you can find subway cars or buses out there that are uh, crowded where social distancing doesn't exist. Like It's a one foot social distancing instead of a two meter or six feet. Um, so um, we we estimated what's going to happen in the future, of course, because we need to be prepared. So we hired a firm, McKinsey, uh, that gave us projections early on in uh, April and May, and they're uh, re-evaluating uh, those numbers now. And what it looks like right now is by the end of 2024, we will reach 80% of pre-COVID ridership. And this is due in large part to several companies. Um, I, I had calls with uh, you know, the finance institutions in Wall Street and so on, and they basically said they will never come back to work the way they did before. Uh, large engineering companies have said the same thing. They've offered their employees to work remotely forever. Uh, so this 20% that we see that's not going to come back uh, until the end of 2024 is due to all these large companies that can uh you know keep their employees working remotely they've seen an uptick in um uh, the way that these people work the productivity that that they they get uh because like all of us uh, that are working from home from time to time you know you get up in the morning and where you used to get ready in the morning at 5 30 or 6 o'clock and get to the office um you know eventually all that time is now free time. So when people have their cup of coffee in the morning, they sit in front of the computer and they start working. Uh, so their work day is a lot longer and productivity is a lot higher than it used to be. And the same thing goes in the evening. So these companies have said, hey, you know what? It's costing me less money and it's increasing productivity. Uh, so they're gonna keep their employees away. It's a projection, we'll see what happens, but that's what we think right now. Um, and the increase in ridership, uh, which I, I didn't put the slide here because they're working on those numbers right now, but it's going to be very gradual over the next few years. So even with everything we know today, it's not going to skyrocket and go back to normal or over capacity like it was pre-COVID, um, according to these projections. Some of the other things that we did, um, you know, you can see on the top left uh, little box there, the enhanced cleaning that I was talking about there uh, just before. Uh, so you can see that we clean, uh, you know, at least 100% of every piece of rolling stock. And in several, uh, you know, of the agencies, we go well above that. And YCT subways, for example, 340%. So we, every car gets touched, clean, sanitized uh, three, almost four times a day. Every station gets sanitized twice a day. Um, and you see a few a few interesting stats on the right, the little uh, table on the right, the amount, the in, incredible amount of product that we've used so far uh, for uh, for COVID. 
right? So of course, regular cleaners, uh, but uh, disinfectant, 128,000 uh, bottles are in stock at all times, and we continue ordering more. Uh, 137,000 boxes of wipes and uh, gloves in the seven million dollar range. Hand sanitizer, 164,000, 165,000 bottles. And these are uh, the little bottles. Uh, governor, the governor of New York State um, got the prisoners to start making uh, sanitizer. So we, we had access to uh, state sanitizer for, for a long period of time. Um, and and um, several you know, uh, orders of masks from all over the world, as you can see here. Uh, some we hand out to passengers and of course for our employees. So uh, we're at over 15 million masks in stock and um, our burn rate is about uh, uh, 80,000 masks a day. Um, on the bottom left, you can see the latest stats from, uh, from uh, December. Um, so employees reporting COVID because now we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence. So 36 uh, on the 9th of uh, this month and, and 34 is the seven, seven day average. We're well be below the uh, city of New York rate of infection uh, right now. We're at about a little bit less than half, but still it's concerning. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit. Um, during uh, the, uh, the the months of uh, April, May, June, um, unfortunately, we lost over 130 employees uh, to COVID. Um, and um, at one point in April, we had over 6,000, 6,500 employees that were uh, in quarantine, either because they had COVID or because they had been in close contact with somebody who had COVID. So you can imagine um, how you try to run service when you have 6,000 of your frontline workers that are just not coming to work uh, for a period of 14 days at the time, that was the period of time. Um, so it made service uh, very difficult. And this is, this is uh, the people listening are a population of, uh, of uh, planners, uh, schedulers, and 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 uh, roles like this, uh, you can imagine the challenge in going from running a 24-hour operation to all of a sudden not having enough people to run this service and trying to figure out the best way to run, um, you know, a service, the best service that you can, because that's what mass transit is all about. Um, so we, the executive group, were on the phone, uh, you know, very regularly with the, the various health centers, hospitals, and so on, to make sure that we were very aware of uh, where people were coming from and to uh, in their workforce. So we needed to keep bringing the nurses and doctors to the hospitals and the, the various health centers. Uh, so we were working in very close uh, relationship with, with all those people, as well as other essential workers. Uh, and we even went as far as providing uh, free rides in, in um, um, personal cars type vehicles uh, to some of those people if we didn't have enough people to, to run the bus route, for example, where um, a nurse needed to go from her house to a hospital, we provided a service to make sure that all those people kept uh, being able to go to work. Um, you see the, the numbers on the lower right um, about employees in quarantine. So our, our numbers are good. We're just at about, about 1,500 employees right now. Uh, which is good compared to the 6,500. Um, and the numbers of uh, self-positive and, and confirmed positives are, uh, you know, in the 36 uh, range. This weekend, last weekend, uh, we had 25 new reports. Uh, so that means that the Thanksgiving holiday, um, you know, gatherings are starting to show themselves, show, show the ugly head of uh, COVID again, as we saw an uptick uh, over the weekend, and we see that in all of our agencies. So some of the things that uh, I wanted to touch on is uh, some of the policies and best practices. So of course, we're continuing with a sanitizing program uh, very aggressively, and we're not cutting those costs, even though, as you may have heard, we, we don't have money, but but that's a different story. Um, we're continuing to require face covering to be worn by everybody on the system, the entire system, employees and people. I talked about that a little bit before. Uh, we distribute PPE to employees and the general public. Um, and uh, 
the system will continue to be shut down between 1 and 5 a.m. Uh, until the pandemic is behind us. So that'll be later on in 2021. Um, you know, speculation is whatever, but uh, I don't think it'll be before the fall of 2021. Uh, we'll see with the vaccines starting to be distributed and stuff when there's a herd immunity uh, is what the healthcare professionals will tell us. And then we can look at reducing some of those restrictions. Um, employees returning to work um, has been on pause, as I've mentioned before. Most agencies have reduced service levels due to low ridership. And we're looking at doing a little bit more of that as we go forward. And now we have 1,500 employees out. So we don't want to have um, no spare employees to run the essential service. So, so we'll take pre, um, you know, preemptive action to make sure that we keep some people in reserve so that we can continue providing the service that we have to. And um, uh, a little bit on the finance, uh, we have a structural deficit, and I, I think uh, Cassandra kind of touched on that a little bit before. So we're preparing to reduce our service levels for board approval um, because even pre-pandemic, when you run a mass transit uh, system like the MTA or just about any other system that I've talked to in the United States, um, you know, we were built over the years, 116 years in Boston, even longer, um, as, as really truly a mass transit where you welcome everybody who wants to travel on the system and your job is to move them efficiently and safely from point A to point B. Um, that is not a cost effective thing to do um, when you're providing uh, you know, more service than, uh, than, than uh, there are people to travel on it. So we're looking at, um, you know, we're starting to think now at reducing costs by reducing services because there's so few people traveling on our systems, but also thinking about what else could happen to make public transit or mass transit a, a system that's funded differently than the majority from the fare box and uh, a little bit from the city of New York in our case and a little bit from the state. Um, and it's very difficult to get you know, our, our operating budget is $17 billion a year. It's very difficult to get $17 billion every year to run a system like this. So that's something that we, I think all of us uh, in the United States, uh, in the Americas, but the world, because I, I do a lot of forums with uh, the world community, they're all thinking about this right now. Um, you can see the stats about, uh, uh, you know, the number of uh, PPEs that we distribute out to, to everybody, our employees and, uh, and everybody else on there. And uh, really, you know, th this is our latest campaign now that we're, uh, we're starting. So we're using real employees um, to continue the messaging about the importance of wearing face covering. And uh, for the traveling public, you see now the... The little characters have uh, hats on as uh, the temperature is getting a little bit colder. Um, at least for us in New York, I don't think in Florida you have that concern just yet. Um, so we see we we see a real uh, change in the travel patterns. Uh, the people in the Hamptons aren't coming back on the Long Island Railroad, for example. Um, our system, with all the actions that I've touched on, and I probably forgot about half of them, um, we've created resilience there which makes sure that we, we've done everything that we can to, to show the people uh, that could travel on our systems that it is safe. And, and all kinds of studies have now come out saying that touch point infection is very, very difficult. So you can't, um, it's very difficult to get the COVID virus by touching a handrail that somebody else has just touched even though they may have had uh, COVID or sneezed on it or whatever, and then you touch your face it's likely that you will not get it that way. It's more the, the vaporizing uh, spray that's out there. Uh, the best practices that I've talked about, about sanitizing, um, spraying, um, UV lights and others, um, and, and really the policies that we're putting in place now are to, um, you know, to reduce the service while keeping social distancing as best as possible. It's not gonna be perfect. Uh, but to also start saving costs because our revenues, of course, are not coming in because of this reduced uh, ridership. And uh, those are my comments. I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Mario, for sharing your very first year of challenge with New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority in early 2020. Uh, not only did you rise to the challenges, but you've also taken the time to share this information with all of us here in Central Florida. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our panelists today. Your presentations have shown us that from the national perspective, other geographic areas of the United States and right here in Central Florida, we are all experiencing similar trends and challenges and our transportation professionals have risen to the challenges to evaluate and meet the needs of our customers. Uh, thank you also to our viewers here in Central Florida today for participating and seeking to learn and engage. We've seen some great questions come in via our chat feature and we'll now begin a short Q&A portion for our forum. Our panelists will turn on all of their cameras and I'll do my best to share one question per panelist. And I'd like to ask the panelists to um, keep some responses brief so we can get one per presenter. And then afterwards we put in the chat feature here that we'll follow up with all of our presenters questions with all of you and provide a link to this recording for your future reference and sharing. So with that, I have one question here that we've selected for Neil. Neil, do you have more information about COVID's impact on density and distribution on office space? You reference government's willingness to pay subsidies for transit. Do you think this will increase or decrease? So um, obviously decisions regarding uh, movement of offices is something that's going to occur over a long period of time. So. We don't have specific information, but I do know that there are organizations that are starting to uh, track that. I think time is only going to tell in terms of government's willingness to be able to cover the subsidies that are required. And uh, the first test is going to be whether Congress actually passes the stimulus bill that uh, is on their plate right now. So I'll keep it at, uh, at that because I know you want brief answers. Absolutely. And if you have more to expand on that, we'd be happy to share that with our viewers today. Our next question is for Jessica. How do you monitor the citations for speeding? Is it for specific corridors? And if so, how do you choose the corridors? Um, so the speeding citation data we have on the mobility dashboard is for the entire state. So our Registry of Motor Vehicles is one of the divisions of MassDOT. So um, right now we just have all of the citations and I don't believe it's very easy for us to look at it by corridor on sort of a, a broad level. But I think, um, you know, if there's any deep dive analyses we can do, that would be interesting. And we're actually at MassDOT just kicking off a new project um, to relook at how we set speed limits um, and sort of policies around that um, as a state as we sort of dive deeper into our vision zero efforts. So um, we did see a, a big increase in speeding citations during the pandemic with less congestion. Um, that's sort of come down to normal levels, but we are sort of taking this as an opportunity to dive into more work to do around speed reductions. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, our next question is for Cassandra. Do you anticipate any of the workforce trips to be future routes and schedules as things improve? Could you repeat that for me? Sure. Uh, do you anticipate any of the workforce trips uh, that you've been working on to be future routes and schedules as, as things improve? I don't know that there'll be new routes necessarily, but I do think it'll be a shift in where we put our resources. We're already seeing that with our COVID release plan um, in that we're increasing the frequencies on these routes that our long-term vision says that we do want these to be higher frequency bus rapid transit routes anyway. Um, what we're allowed to do at this point from our board's perspective is to take a look at those lower performing routes and not put the service back on those. Um, that has been a big debate at our board level of are we a coverage system or are we a core network system? Um, and so that conversation will continue and now we'll have the data, not just the theory of how that might work. That's an excellent um, thought process and a challenge I'm sure many are thinking about. It's great to hear uh, how, how you're approaching some of these questions. Uh, our next question is for Mario. Is there any discussion on the cost versus the benefit of the resources being expended on sanitizing? 
Well, um, of course, it's a cost, right? We never planned on mm -hmm. it before February, uh, but we had to pivot. And, and uh, no matter what the cost is, it's something we have to do. We all have to do it, I think. Um, and we're, of course, counting those costs uh, so that we keep track of what they are. But we're, we're not doing a cost benefit analysis. We're doing the work because it needs to be done until uh, we reach herd immunity or uh, health professionals say that doing that work is, uh, is not ne needed. But in the meantime, uh, there's no cost benefit analysis. We're just doing it. That's great. Thank you so much. So with that, uh, I'd like to have um, a moment to thank all of our presenters. Uh, we cannot express enough how much we appreciate you coming here virtually to Central Florida. Uh, our distinguished national panel has been really spectacular for our viewers in Central Florida. Uh, we hope that everyone has gained some important information from each other and together we will enter 2021 more informed and prepared to face the new challenges ahead. Uh, I'd like to share that we'll follow up on the remaining questions with our presenters and share those responses with you. And we'll also provide a link to this recording for your future reference and sharing. Um, we'd like to encourage you to take our survey about this session, and we hope you all have a safe and wonderful holiday season. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kristen for any other logistics that we might need to cover. No, Brenda, I think you covered it great. Um, as you mentioned, when everyone exits, a survey will launch. Just take a moment to fill that out. And I will echo Brenda's um, comments and just thanking all of our presenters for a wonderful presentation today. And um, to everyone, have a great holiday, and we will um, talk to you soon. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for having us.